this was played at one three at Casino Niagara. There's a three hundred dollar cap, and it's a seven dollar session fee. This is in the U.S. or Canada? No, this is Canada. Okay, so Niagara Falls, Canada. They, do they have um? What the fuck was that dumpy ass casino? Seneca was it Seneca? <laughs> did, did that place still <laughs> exist anymore? I think they their poker room is closed. I think it got closed during COVID. Oh, okay. And I've heard from other players that they're planning on reopening it or something like that. But okay. we're getting a lot of the players from there now. So I have been to Casino Niagara in Canada. It was one of our, it was our first stop actually uh, for Poker Road back in 2007. Joe Seabock, uh, Barry Greenstein, stepson who owned that company, they didn't allow him into Canada. We had to turn oh. around, and then Amanda Leatherman, who is Daniel Lagrano's wife. Now, Amanda Leatherman and I had to cross by ourselves and leave Joe in a hotel. That was back at the end of 2007. Another interesting thing about that was the Canadian money was worth more than the U.S. dollar at that time, and they had not updated the toll signs, so they charged more Canadian. But anyways, okay, wow. one three Niagara, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one three, and I'm fairly deep now. I I'm trying to. I kind of piece together the hand after the fact. So not all the details I think are exact because I didn't write them all down, but most of the, like, like the major spots and stuff I'm pretty clear on. So, okay. Um, yeah. So Dylan and I had roughly a thousand in front of us. So we're fairly deep. CAD um, thousand CAD, right? Sorry. A thousand CAD. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then, so, um, the villain in middle position opens for 15, which is kind of what the standard opening size has been at the table. Um, and I'd seen some kind of wild, um, like I saw some three bets with like pocket sixes from early position. I saw some three bet calls, um, even from this villain with like some lighter hands too. So I saw some, it was really kind of looser action. Um, and then, so anyway, villain opens for, for 15, um, Hijack calls, um, cutoff calls, and I'm in the small blind with Ace of Diamonds, Queen of Clubs, and I three bet to sixty dollars. Okay, yeah, I remember you sending this one in. Just there's a little bit on the smaller side here because you get two field callers here. So normally, you know, from out of position, and really easy way to do this is to three to four X plus the limpers. So if you went four X plus the limpers, you know, you're talking about making it like 90 you just went straight 4x it's just a little bit subtle it is a little bit small i think from from out of position though so you three bet to 60 okay yeah yeah i did review the hand with a couple of players afterwards and i totally agree that that was something i should have done i should have three bet a little bit bigger pre-flop yeah. um for sure um okay so then villain calls hijack folds and then the cutoff player calls and the cutoff was kind of a standard one three player she was like on the looser side i saw her call down with like some offsuit kind of broadway hands from early position that kind of thing and um villain seems solid i didn't play a lot with him i don't have a whole lot of history with him so. yeah i mean he should be really tight there so hero three bets to 60 loonies in the small blind mp1 calls <laughs> hijack folds cutoff calls and we're about at 200 now ish yeah i think i got like it's it's it was at like 195 but okay yep and i think at the table i was picturing like it was roughly 180 so um and then the flop was queen of um queen of spades four hearts three of diamonds okay pretty good flop for you yeah i uh -huh. thought so <laughs> and so i bet 120 and the villain calls and the cutoff folds so mp1 calls next to act cutoff folds you bet 120 into about 195 i suppose that's okay so here's the interesting thing about here too and i think that you can see why you'd actually want to choose a slightly smaller sizing multi-way, I'd have no problem with this sizing if you were heads up. Like, say MP1 just defended and you were heads up, you can go large. You're absolutely allowed to go large. And the reason why is because the MP1 really does have to, he can't just fold a pair. Um, even like pair, I mean, even like nines or tens, it's really hard. But when, when you get multi-way here, when you take this sizing, basically you force MP1 to almost have to have a queen here to continue now obviously the, the lady from behind and the cutoff can call a little bit wider but you sort of shut out a lot of weaker hands from mp1 so i mean listen it's small stakes i mean you should have seen some of the shit i, I put in a, t a, a session at tch last night at 2.5 uh you know some people will continue sure but they're not supposed to really he should have a queen here or a draw there really aren't that many draws i mean the draws would be like you know an ace five 
uh, five, six suited, if those are called with somebody behind, things like that. But then that's, that's the theory behind why you wouldn't go two thirds multi-way, but okay. So MP1 calls and then the cutoff folds. So now the pot's right around probably 435, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got written down to. Okay. It's, it's a little over 400. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I went with uh, a bit of a larger size just cause I saw some kind of wild, like some real loose calls post swap. And I was thinking more from like, I don't know, an exploitative point of view, I guess that way, because I'd seen these guys call really light with things like second pairs and third pairs and things. So, like that. So, so this guy in the live chat here, I don't know how Zally CM AD prof says he's not shutting out nine, nine through Jack, Jack. I mean, the thing though is, is that like that the guy in the middle has somebody behind him though. You know, it, it, it's, it's, yeah. it, I mean, obviously the guy would call if he didn't have anyone behind him, you know, I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. All right. So 435 to the turn. Okay. Okay. And the turn is the eight of hearts. Okay. And, um, I chose to check here and I was the thinking more from like a pot control point of view and disguising the strength of my hand a bit. And if he did have some of those second pair hands, I was hoping he would call off like a riverbed at that point. So I check and then the villain ends up checking behind. So this is interesting here. You know, what's funny. I mean, you block some uh, having queen X here a little bit, but I, I could, <laughs> the call is so strong from MP1 when he's not going to have a whole lot of pocket threes or pocket fours that you can almost play your hand deceptively strong. And what I mean by that is, I mean, first of all, this would not be a check for, for pot control for me. I might even consider check raising the turn sometimes maybe with a little bit shallower stacks with over pairs that unblock queen X here because he just always has a queen here a lot or he'll bet off a draw because it's such an extreme multi-way snare. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I, I'm, I'm not really scared of two pair or so whenever you throw out the combos of sets and two pair, it's really hard for your hand not to be best here. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of my thought, but I, in general, I would actually continue betting here and just go through streets, go bet, 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 unless something kind of weird happens with the kicker coming in or something like that. But okay. You check. So it. would you use like a smaller sizing then? Like, cause that, this was something, this was one of the big kind of, I think I might go for, for me stacks. With the hand. No, I think I yeah. go, I, I think he, the person he, they should have a queen there. Whether you use a smaller sizing of 150 or 175, if he was hanging on with like 10, 10, jack, jack, through 9, 9, I don't know if he continues on. I just want to get max value from a queen. If you go 275 call, the pot's 1,000, and then you've got like a half pot size bet left. I, I would, because you took the flop sizing you did and the distribution and the texture of the board, I would pretty much be going for stacks here for, for with three streets. Now, will you value on yourself against like king, king? Once in a great while, but I think King King gets four bet off with the guy behind him. I mean, that's just, you know, that, that, that that's me looking at it from afar. I realize it's one three. I realize some wacky shit can happen, but still baseline fundamental play is, is still, I think, a decent approach. So 435 to the river. Okay. Okay. The river is the ace of hearts. So backdoor comes in and I've got top two. Yeah. For the podcast people to visualize this, the board is queen of spades, four of hearts, three of diamonds eight of hearts, ace of hearts. So the four of hearts is out there. And this is really important when you're doing hand reading um, for the possibility of backdoor flushes coming in. You've got to notice what is not possible in terms of the backdoor. So here, the villain could have queen X of hearts here. Um, and then, you know, they can't have like ace five or ace deuce of hearts because the ace of hearts comes I don't know what three, and then I would, three X is pretty much out of there too, because the ace of hearts comes at the end. So, but queen X of hearts is possible. Like if you had ace queen with the queen of hearts here, it would just be really, really hard for this guy to have a flush unless he had like five, six of hearts, the, the way the distribution of the board is here. Yeah. I, for some reason, I just didn't, I didn't consider this guy having the hearts at that point. Like I just, the, the, the one hand that we talked about afterwards was just maybe something like King Queen of, of Hearts, right? I just didn't see him um, getting all the way there with with that hand. But I know I checked the turn and stuff, so I know that. Yeah, I mean, the, this, here, here's my approach to the sizing here. I would use kind of a blockish sizing, not because I'm scared of getting raised, just because you want to you wanna sort of – you actually do want to be a little bit balanced here where – 
you you are giving this guy a price to call with Queenex the check behind um where you know you might have some bluffs like if you go full pot it's really really hard for Queenex to call but if you just go 175 here it's kind of like a merge sometimes you might have a delayed bluff and here you're just begging for a call from a queen so i probably would go like 175 um, or maybe even a little smaller than that, actually. What's one third? One third might be like 140, something like that. Yeah, I ended up betting, like, I, I was thinking along the same lines. I, I bet I bet 100, which is a little bit too small, I think. And then um, my kind of thinking at the time was, if he did have something like a second pair, if he did have, you know, like jacks or tens or something like that, he might be able to, to call that. Um, a worse queen would call that. And then I was thinking it might even induce... Like he might view it as a block if he's a solid player, and he might then, you know, I might induce a bluff. But yeah, um, but here's the, here's the thing with that with that part. There's a couple things going on here. Some people in the live chat said check. I, I definitely don't like check. He just checks behind with a bunch of shit. And the I mean, I guess once I mean five six is going to be doing some betting on the turn. Also, too, like if he did have like ace five ace deuce and he like checks behind, it's a fucking disaster, right? Um, which is the other draw. But uh, here's the thing, like. The whole like, oh, you're betting to try to induce. Remember, he's getting to the river here and you're you're giving him such a price that usually live players won't turn hands into bluffs in spots like this, like Queen X. I mean, it's possible, but even if I have like Queen X here, I'm getting five to one. So um, I think calling is better than than raising because, you know, I don't know what you're folding. What am I folding out that's better? Like if you ran into Ace King or Ace Jack or something like that, and I, that that's kind of my thoughts. But okay, so you bet a hundred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, I was thinking the same thing. Like I don't think he raises Ace King here. I don't think like I, I figured anything that did walk into some kind of value that way would just call behind. So, and so um, I didn't really think the Ace like improved my hand much other than me beating just Kings now at this point, right? So. Yeah, I bet 100, and then he shoves all in for roughly 625. So, shoves for 625. I mean, this is one where, so you bet 100, and he shoves for 625, so it looks like the pot's going to be 535, maybe like in the high 1100s, 1180, maybe like 500 for you to call, something like that. So you're getting over, or 525 for you to call, you're getting over 2 to 1. I mean, here's the thing, there's a couple things going on here, right? Yeah, these are very, very underbluffed spots. The queen, I mean, if you had ace queen with the queen of hearts, it becomes much, much harder to fold. Queen X of hearts is available here. The only thing I'm thinking, though, is, is that is it possible that you might have induced something? But again, he would have to turn something into a bluff that had no showdown and not bet the turn when checked to. Because you checked on a brick. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, and, and I think that the turn is stabbed at a fair amount. Um, I don't think Ace X is turning it into a bluff. It, it's close, man, because it's like it's because you you bet so small. I wonder if you in, in induce. Like it's kind of funny. Like if I went one fifty, and then the guy shoved, even though I'm getting a better price at the end, I might be more apt to fold than here getting a worse price. So. I would just say that these spots are kind of under bluffed. And when you can't find something that your opponent's turning into a bluff, like I said, I think that the turn is stabbed at a fair amount with some of these draws. Ace X is not turning into a bluff. It, it, you know, if you're going to tell me that the guy's got like, you know, some stupid, ridiculous hand, like four deuce offsuit, you know, then everything's out the window. If you've seen the guys do, you know, shit like that. But I'm I'm just telling you from afar. So I, I think it's pretty close. I kind of lean towards a fold, you know, maybe a little bit of history with the guy. Yeah, that was the thing. I, I hadn't seen this guy get out of line at all. Like, he, he seemed solid. I only saw him show relatively, you know, solid hands and good value hands. So I had no reason to think. And at this level, like, I play 2-5 and, and, you know, a little bit higher. And I guess at, at those levels, I'd be, I don't know. I'd be more inclined to think that someone would make a play like this. And, um, and I, but at this point, I even said that at the table, I'm like, this is such an under bluff spot, man. I don't really beat a whole lot here as far as like the bigger value hands go. Cause I, I didn't really think the ACE improved me much. And I figured any, any other draw, like, like, like a wheel draw or one of the gutters there would walk into an ACE would just call my bet. And so I'll it sounds like you folded Tyler. Up. I did fold. Okay. Yeah, I did. And did and, you get to see uh, a reveal? 
Yeah, so he showed seven four of spades. <laughs> seven four of spades. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, somebody had asked, and I did this whole thing on my podcast last week about making a checklist of what to pay attention to with um, your opponents. I don't know if you're a CLP subscriber or not, but one of the things I think is the most important, it's one of my weaknesses actually, is really paying attention to showdowns when you're not involved with the hand. Because if I'm not involved in the hand and I just even see a guy defend with four, seven, four suited to a three bet with a guy behind him, I immediately know he's a bad player. And that's going to make me play differently. Um, yeah. And maybe not make big folds. It, it, you know, th there's so much information in this showdown that, that yeah. it's <laughs> unbelievable, you know? Yeah, that's how I felt too. I'm like, I'm like oh, I just didn't think this type of player had that in him. And now that I did, I'm like, well, if I see him again, like I noticed he didn't get out of line at all for the rest of the session because me and a couple other players broke down the hand. We started talking about it. And <laughs> I said, like, I said, well, he's getting away with that once. Like <laughs> there's never, it's never happening again at this point. So <laughs> um, I appreciate the call. Thank you very much.